One billion row challenge in Golang from 95 seconds to 1.96 seconds. Okay, so if you guys don't know, um, I like reading these because often they they're gonna be they're gonna be filled with a bunch of like information. And I love Golang. Okay, there's a lot of code in here, so I want to go look at how he's doing the codes and how he's making this thing fast. So I'm actually pretty excited about this. Okay, I know we've already done one but I want to love it even more, okay? This is exciting. The one billion row challenge is quite simple. The task is developing a program capable of reading a file with one billion lines, aggregating the information contained in, uh, in each line. By the way, if you don't know, the one billion row challenge started off as a Java challenge and then spread to every single language. This is like the fourth thing that I've read on the one billion row challenge. It's actually super, super cool. I actually think this is quite awesome. Um, and print a report with the result. Each line within a file contains a weather station name, a temperature reading in the format of station name temperature, where station name may be spaces and other special characters uh, excluding that. And the temperature is a floating point number ranging from negative 99.9 to 99.9 with precision limited to one decimal point. The expected output format is station name equals min or uh, min mean max. Holy cow. Dyslexia is kicking in. Sorted alphabetically by station name and where min, mean, and max denote the computed minimum, average, and maximum temperature reading for each respective station. Example of a measurement file. Yellowknife, 16 point whatever. Entebbe, Entiba, Entiba, 32.9. Parto, parto. Example of the expected output. All right, awesome. Uh, given that one billion line file is approximately 13 gigabytes, instead of providing a, f a fixed database, the official repository offers a script to generate synthetic data with random readings. Just follow the instruction to create your own database. Although the challenge is primarily targeted for Java developers, the problem pro uh, presets, presets, the problem presents probably is the term he's going for, uh, an interesting toy exercise to experiment in any language. As I've been working with Golang in a daily basis at Gamers Club, I've decided to give it a try to test how deep I could go. But before going forward with this article, I want to acknowledge that despite being well-versed, I am no specialist in Golang. I am the kind of dumb for low-level optimizations, a uh, domain to which I have never been very interested. In this article, I will pre uh, present all the steps I took to a optimize the solution. Everything was written and tested on a Ryzen 9 7900X PC, not overclocked, so 4.7 gigahertz, with 12 cores and 24 threads. An AS Rock B650 MHDC slash M2 motherboard, a 2x16 gigabyte 6,000 bajillion megahertz DDR5 Kingston Fury Beast RAM. Man, you know, when you're reading, when you start reading computer specs out loud, I feel, it feels funny to say. Is, is he bragging? Is this humble bragging? Yeah, just a little personal PC, you know, just back to back. 32 gigs of really, really, really fast. Not even overclocked. Not even overclocked. Just standard clocked, which is fast enough. Uh, 6 gigahertz is normal for DDR. Okay, I didn't know that. And Kingston SSD SV300 S37A slash 120G Windows 11 and Go 1.22.0 AMD 64. Okay, 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 okay. The partial results I present, or the partial results I present is the lowest consistent value I got for the runs while the editor and browser were open. The final result is presented, the final result is presented by presenting the aggregated result from 55 executions. I'm not gonna lie, if he says the word presented once more, I'm gonna lose it, okay? I can't, I can't, I'm getting, I'm getting satiated. Have you ever had visual satiation? It's happening right now. It's happening right now. How slow is too slow? Before deciding to work seriously on this challenge, I was curious how much uh, how much slow is reading and processing the scary one billion rows file. I had a feeling that the naive approach to it would take a long time. Driven by this curiosity, I wanted to give it a try and implement the simplest solution possible. Name, min, max, count. Okay, good. So this is a pretty classic approach, right? If you have the sum and the count, you can create the average at the very, very end. Pretty straightforward. You have the min and the max. You got a couple extra, uh, you know, you got a couple extra things right here. You got the name. You really technically don't need the name. You could use the key to the map as the name, but whatever. Okay, I digress. All right, uh, data, map, string, station. I wonder if you don't want it as a pointer. Would you want it not as a pointer for even better since you're doing a, literally a billion lookups on this thing? Is at that point, would that like a pointer actually make a difference here? If you're doing 1 billion lookups, I would assume a pointer would actually... Now you're starting to think about pointers. 
Uh, anyways, file, open up the measurements, panic if that's not there, defer the closing, scan uh, the new scanner, scan, line, text, string, line. Okay, so this is like your very simple version of doing this. We all know this one. My, my assumption is this would actually take quite a bit of time to run. All right, so this is like your very simple one, right? Because buffered scanning, I'm not exactly sure what it has to do, but I'm sure it doesn't, it probably scans the string at least once, if not more. Uh, anyways, okay, so we see all this. Now, uh, to my surprise, this code ran, uh, the code above ran in 95 seconds, a lot better than I expected it would be. Note that print result and main functions will be used for the remaining of the article with little to no change. Okay. Okay, so I think everybody saw this one coming, right? It, it seems like if I were to try to optimize this problem, I would start with file reading. Like, how fast can I get file reading done? And, like, that's really your bottom like your 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 bippity bottom here, whatever speed you can do this, you win, right? Like that that's the rest seems like it's it, you don't have to probably consider too hard for optimization. I'm curious about that. Uh, how fast is uh, how fast is possible? Satisfied, I went to bed and I couldn't sleep. I knew how much time I needed to process the data, but I couldn't stop asking what would be the fastest time possible to just open and read the file without overhead of processing. Oh, I'm very actually happy he's going this direction because this is actually my question with Go. I have no idea. I am actually very excited about uh, this because I wanted to know how fast can you read it in, right? That was what I just stated and... I'm curious how he does this because I assume you just can't use this. You can't use a buff IO because a buff IO by the very nature has to read data, put it in here, and then you have to read it again to like you doing something is my understanding, right? And so I can't imagine this will work, right? Let's see. First try. Notice that I'm using bytes instead of string. It, uh, a quick research told me that string conversion is slower and involves allocation of memory. The bytes function reuse of an internal buffer, returning the same object, so there's no additional allocation. The result was astonishing. 36 seconds. Okay. I think you can still go faster. Scanner buffer. Scanner default configuration is really bad for the task. I already knew that it was possible to reach much, much faster since Java uh, entries could reach the same result in 1.5 seconds, but 36 seconds was surprisingly slow. The scanner class has a buffer function, which accepts a predefined byte object and a maximum number of elements for the case when the buffer uh, can grow up, to, uh, up in size. Without much details about how it works internally, I tried to use it and tested some different values for the buffer size. Oh, nice. Okay. Okay. Look at that. Interesting. Reduce this calls equals win. Yeah. Okay. So, you, I mean, with this, with this buffered one, you can get it at least down quite a bit. Okay. I mean, I guess this makes sense, right? In the sense that if you have a small buffer, you have to constantly be reading over and over and over and over and over and over again. Well, at some point, it has to get worse, right? At some point, it has to get worse because this is a lot of bufferings, Right. I think at some point it has to get worse because you're no longer... I wonder why, why the reason is. I'd have to think about that, actually. I guess you're not... Is there a reason why that'd be worse? Because my assumption is allocating this would take almost no almost no time, right? Allocating this should take almost no time. Reading empty space? Oh, you think it's reading empty space? Hmm, much better. So using a buffer around 20... Uh, this one, uh, bytes... 4 to 16 megabytes, respectively, could improve uh, 80%, reaching around 6.7 seconds. Okay, so I think you can still get faster. So experimenting uh, how fast Go can do this. Okay, so that's, I mean, this is pretty interesting. So scanner is, scanner's not all that fast. Buff reader, another quick test I could do was using a buffio.reader object, which would read byte by byte. Okay, this change actually increased the time to 25.5 seconds. Okay, yeah, I, I would assume that makes sense because I assume you're having a lot of the same problems here, right? Uh, all right, we were there. Let's see, buff. I, let's see, buff reader line. Instead of a reader read byte, I tried read line. I assume this would actually still get. This is still bad, which got it all the way down to this. Okay, we're not there yet, so we're still not there yet. I like. I like his. I like his attempts here. Like I like what he's doing, by the way, which is just. I I do like just trying a bunch of stuff and just measuring it empirically and coming up with an idea as to what what's going to happen here. I think this is good. After some initial exploration, I checked out how scanner.scan works internally, and I noticed that it does a lot of things that I don't need. It manipulates the buffer object a lot. Not sure why. I also found, not sure why, Chesterton's fence mentioned. Uh, I also found that it uses file.read, which I never used before. Let's try it out. Ah, all of a sudden you get the control. All of a sudden, you get the control how big that buffer is. Hopefully, he takes his ideas from the previous one, these larger buffers, and maybe uses that. Okay? That would be fantastic, right? All right. Resulting in 18.86 seconds. 
Okay, so not that fast. You're still not quite there. Uh, notice that file.read accepts a buffer. When, can, uh, when we configure the buffer in scanner object internally, scanner uses this buffer to read from file. So I tested different buffer sizes again. There we go. Let's go. Okay, we're starting to get closer. We're starting to get closer. All right, I like it. I like it. I'm surprised. So I'm surprised it's going to take him a half second to process through all that data. But okay. Okay, I, I guess I could believe it. It's a billion objects. It's a billion things you have to parse in a half second. Actually, that's, you know, now that I say that out loud, that's, it feels fast. I wonder what it would take in JavaScript. I wonder how fast you could make this in JavaScript. I don't know. Now I want to try. Now I actually want to see how fast can you make it in JavaScript. Just because it's so hard to get JavaScript to run correctly, probably close. You could probably make it fairly close because you got to remember that when you call to a map, you're calling to C++ functions. When you read from a file, you're effectively doing C++ stuff. I think this is where bun versus no node would make a huge difference. Two business days. <laughs> All right. Dave... <laughs> It's gonna be about two business days. Um, great. Now that we make a lot more sense. Okay. All right. Now that makes uh, now now that make a lot more sense. Okay. Good. So we're looking good. I like it. I lack the knowledge to explain why large buffer file reads is so much better than other versions, but I believe it may be related to how the information is retrieved from SSD. Yes, you're calling the system a lot less, right? You stay in your land longer than than an other person's land. Uh, to finish up the minimum structure, I want to communicate with multiple Go routines to get the feel of how much overhead that could add. My idea was to create a single Go routine, send the buffer directly to it uh, using a channel, so I can measure the cost of communication alone. Interesting. Yeah, because you almost because you, you couldn't reuse the buffer. I bet you could kind of cheat the system. By making like something like five buffers, the indent is insane. It's just because it's a tab, right? Welcome to tabs. Tabs on the internet. You know, for all those people saying tabs are appear good and everyone should just use tabs, there's always internet problems. Okay. We still got a long way to go. We still got a long way to go. Okay. All right, to finish up the minimum structure, I want to communicate with multiple Go routines. Okay, we already did this one. So this makes sense. So here, the consumer is just reading from the channel. Uh, writer is literally just sending these things one at a time. Okay, cool. This increased uh, time to 1.266 seconds. Interesting. I'm a little bit surprised by that. I'm surprised it took, uh, oh, is he using a buffer channel? No, yeah, he's even using a buffer channel. I'm a little bit surprised that it took 0.3 seconds to send that over. Is it really that that much? I guess, yeah, it's a billion roach. I guess you're sending over a billion items. You're sending over a billion items. I I, I can never remember. Do, do, is a go routine different than a co-routine? I would say no. I sort of, I'm assuming depending on how you allocate this, but probably not. Like not a co-routine. You think a co-routine is different? Like a sort of? I can never tell. When, when it comes to a co-routine... Is that just is 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 that exclusively so? Just for my own knowledge, when people use the term coroutine, does that imply no parallelism, or does it imply there could be parallelism? That's the one thing I don't know. Coroutines are two generators yielding to each other. There's no actual parallelism. Yeah, so that that was my question: was is a coroutine because Lua coroutines uh, aren't they don't run in parallel. There's no parallelism. Okay. Okay. Then a go routine does have parallelism. You can have parallelism and go routines are effectively just, you know, you got these nice green threads. So my question was, does a go, does a channel, is a channel a lock free queue? Kotlin co routines can be parallel. Okay. Well that ruins everything. Yeah. It does have a, well, of course it has some sort of schedule during the leg, the leg work. Um, I mean, anything that anything that's doing async stuff or anything that's doing stuff and running in parallel, you have some managed environment running it, right? There's, there's no. It would make zero sense if you didn't, right? They, how could it ever even run? Something's doing it, right? Go routines are are made parallel via threads. Yes, a go routine has a mutex. Okay, interesting. It has a mutex. Okay, you mean a, not a go routine? A a uh, a channel. A channel has a mutex. Okay, I feel like I've asked this question before. If a channel is a lock-free queue, or if it's a mutex-protected item, but okay, so it's a, it's a. I wonder, 
I wonder if there's there's a speed difference. I have no idea. I honestly have I have no idea the speed difference between a lock free queue versus a mutex channel. I have no idea. Um, copying the buffer. All right. Let's see. I still got some problems. The first one is that the file dot read buffer will override the buffer every. Let's see. Let's see. Buffer every reading. Thus, if we send the buffer to the channel directly, among other synchronization problems, the consumer will read inconsistent data. This problem will be even worse when we add more Go routines. Correct. I wonder if you even really need more Go routines. Uh, to avoid this situation, I will copy the buffer data into another array. See, I don't think you need. I wonder if you need to do that. I don't think you need to do that. Uh, increasing the time to about 2.3 seconds, uh, almost doubling it. Notice that I tried to create a slice and copy the data uh, manually with for this without any improvement. Okay. So now we're, we're back to being slow. We're back to being slow and sag again. Single go routine, copying buffer. People, let's see, uh, people uh, take over two weeks to review my diffs and I'm being pushed out. Oh, sorry. We're in the middle of something. We're in the middle. So I can't, I can be asking questions about things. Plus, you kind of gave me like the middle. You gave me like the middle of it. I don't even know like the ends of it. I have no idea what you're talking about. Flip, take that out. If you can, flip, please. Flip. I'm telling you, flip. Could you take that out? All right. Leftover logic. A, let's see. A natural way to scale our solution is spending each chunk or sending each chunk of data to a different Go routine in parallel. The Go routines aggregate or aggregate the data independently. And when finished, the main thread should merge the information. I believe that this process is similar to how no squeal databases optimize their queries. However, at this point, the main thread uh, reads a fixed buffer amount from the file, but the lines can have different lengths, which means that the buffer will cut off the last line unless we're really lucky. Yes. Yes. I added leftover logic to store incomplete last line from one read uh, from one reading to be used as the first part of the next chunk. Interesting. 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 I don't know if I would do that. Nice. By the way, for those that are wondering, 10. 10 is the value of a new line character, if I'm not mistaken, right? It's hex A, which is the new line. Because you don't actually have to do this. Interesting. Anyways, whatever. Uh, all right, so we're at 2.3 seconds. Okay, so how does he get it lower? You're hexy. Yeah, I know. All right. Workers and communications. As I stated previously, the natural evolution from here is to create a workflow where go routine process the uh, data ch uh, chunks and return the partial aggregation uh, and the main thread merges and presents the results. Okay. Yeah. My idea was creating a list of go routines and sending the data to each of them sequentially, cycling the go routines until the end of the file. There was no significant increase of, uh, of time with this modification. At this point, I just copied the old processing with a few changes. Okay. So... Why are we still using scanner? I thought we're done using scanner here, people. Were we done using scanner? Did we not prove that you gotta do you gotta do this one? You guys drop the scanner. Anyways, input chan. Oh, is that thing? This article is much better than I expected. Why? Uh, I thought this article was gonna be great, right? All right. So we see all these things. We're gonna do some parsing, some floating, some blah 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 blah. All right, consumer. Okay, so this is a consumer. Here we go. Oh, okay, so it's reading this and it's using a scanner to read the data. Oh, interesting. It's using a scanner. Crazy. Okay. That seems like a lot of work for this, it, especially since the temperature, you know, is a single decimal point of precision and it's always within like this very specified amount. It kind of feels like you could always make like a pretty easy read here, right? The read are somewhere, the, the read is somewhere between three to five bytes every single time. All right. Anyways. Okay. So they do a lot of this, blah, blah, blah. We've already seen all this. They've read, they, oh, file reading. We've already talked about that. They do the copying with the leftover data send over the data current worker doing one of these little cycly things by the way okay nice beautiful uh do this thing do all that thing little wake group wait for all the workers to finish okay fantastic and then we put all the data together and then i guess you aggregate all the data okay okay now we got two new parameters to adjust, the number of workers and the size of the uh, buffer channel. To discover the impact of these parameters, I created a grid test uh, that run with each pair of configuration to see the results. Okay, well, that's well done. Well done. Buffers and workers. Okay, so I don't know why that one, I don't know why that one's better. <laughs> I can't, I don't know why that one's better, but okay. I like this. I mean, I like, I like what he's doing here. This is good. This is really great exploration work, by the way. Uh, as expected, for somebody that, like, because you got to remember, this guy explicitly stated he is not somebody that knows about a bunch of low-level optimization. Like, he just does, he has no idea. 
So he's just experimenting. I love I love watching uh, empirical investigations go down. This much code better be building a full operating system or I'm going to be disappointed. Uh, as expected, a few Go routines uh, with a si uh, single message buffer in the channel lock the main thread waiting to channel let's see waiting for the channel to become available there was no significant gain with more than 25 workers after the buffer size of 10 for a balanced setting i will proceed with 25 workers and a buffer size of 25 okay right in this re he's shooting for this region right here okay i uh, love latin modern uh, serif okay okay i'm glad you love that <laughs> discovery and progress managers be like push it to prod we're done good enough Optimization. Starting from the basic implementation, I'll show how I identified and worked to optimize individual code paths. If you wish to repeat the process, you can add the following snippet at the beginning of your program. CPU profiler prof. This. Okay, so we're going to start doing a little bit of that delicious CPU profiler. Let's go. All right. Then I'll run the uh, tool. Uh, go tool p prof HTTP this thing right here, CPU profiler prof, which will open uh, a detailed site showing the CPU profile insights. The image below is one, let's see, is one of the reports presented by the site called a flame graph. Uh, here, technically, it's an icicle chart, okay, because it's hanging from the, it's a stalagmite because it's hanging from the ceiling and not going upwards like flames. You know, some people try to call these things icicle charts instead of flame graphs. You know, we used to have just one term for things, and then people got so cutesy, and then all of a sudden now, some people toss out the phrase icicle chart, and I'm just like, is it stalactite? I think it's stalagmite. Is it? Am I wrong on this one? Stalag, st stalag, I don't, I don't even know how to spell the effing thing. Oh, damn, you're right. It's rising from the floor. Man. Oh, man, I'm stupid. St <sighs> damn. Stalag, these nuts got to God, my, my cave, my cave knowledge. Gosh dang, people, my cave knowledge is so weak. Anyways, by the way, can we just take one brief second here? Just one brief second here and just appreciate that this is supported in Go. Can we just all be very happy that this is free? Free in Go. JavaScript can do that. JavaScript cannot do that, my friend. Okay? You have to use what is referred to as the Chrome debugger protocol to hook up specifically to V8 to be able to transfer out this type of information. You have to be able to use that. Chrome does not do that. Or, I mean, uh, JavaScript does not do that. V8 does that. Um, JavaScript Core has some level of support for that, and it's been varying over the years. And as, as Chrome adds something like, say, the performance timeline, which is the new thing they've been pushing, you'll notice that something like JavaScript Core does not have it. B uh, Bun slash Dino support. So those are runtimes. Bun uses JavaScript Core, which means it's going to lag behind anything that you see in V8 because V8 is Chrome. Right, I mean the same same team, so they're working hand in glove. Dino, on the other hand, is using V8, so technically it should be able to do that, long as the runtime allows for you to interact and set those flags. All right, anyways, fantastic. Okay, so what do we got here? Look at that! Look at that parse float. You knew it was going to be parse float. That son of a bitch was going to be parse float. You knew for a fact that son of a bitch was going to be a parse float. Let's see. Let's begin with a byte split function, or which I'm let's see, which I'm using to split the name and temperature readings for each line. As we can see, the flame graph most of the time consumed is uh, attributed to memory allocations. Runtime make slice and make uh, malloc GC. The simplest solution is to keep a fixed size buffer for the name and temperature and copy the bytes from the original line into new buffers. Yeah, 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 yeah. That makes sense. Um, How, how do they how do they do that? Okay, we got this nice little output channel, weight, weight group. We all have all this stuff. Do we have like a fixed size buffer? There we go, named buffer, temperature buffer. We do this thing. I'm trying to find where he does this thing. I don't know where he's doing this. Could you like not convert it to a string? Could you just store a series of bytes, a byte array as a key? I wonder how that keys into this. With this change, we could only reach 5.5 seconds. Uh, optimizing solution, removing the byte split reduced about almost three seconds of total time. This is where things get funny. Right? Isn't it funny how once you get into this level of optimization when it comes to this many items, simple things like this actually make like second difference. That's why I like, you know, that's why I always have that grudge with the for each loop in JavaScript when I was using a for each loop throughout my program because I was trying to be Mr. Good Guy and not use, you know, not use boomer loops. And then all of a sudden, when I just tried for fun to remove my boom or to, or to use boomer loops instead of these for eaches, it, it was like on the order of like six seconds. And I was just like, okay, I'm just not going to use 
stupid loops anymore. I'm going to use boomer loops because that's way better. Boomer loops is four, four loops. Four I equals zero. I has to be less than... There we go. Damn. Now, I feel old. Yeah, well, I'm a boomer, and I like those boomer loops. All right, custom byte hash. Now, the next major offender is bytes to string conversion. See, I was wondering about this. I was wondering about this. A subsequent map lookup. The former is a problem because the statement string name buffer. This is the exact line I was asking about. It's almost like I pre-read this. Also allocates memory. Luckily, this conversion is not necessary for interacting of the loop. The name as string serves two purposes. First, to store it in the station data struct. Second, to be used to look up in the map. The, uh, the map lookup involves extracting a hash from the key and applying internal logic to, uh, to locate the corresponding data within the struct. We can speed up the processing by sending a pre-hashed key. Uh, so I decided to use the FNV hash, which is a built-in and go. I have no idea how it works, but it works. All right, hell yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. Give me that. Give me that data. Give me that data. Reset right. Bam, 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 bam. Let's go. I like it. I like it. I like it. Did did they also alter the line? They must have also altered the line right here. The string data. Wait, hold on. Did you actually keep it in right here? Do you get what? Why, why you gotta keep the string? First off, you spelt that wrong, okay? Uh, first off, sp typo. Second off, you can't just be removing one name and then keeping it also right here. Just drop the station name, dog. All right, there you go. That improved it. All right, all right. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, parsing float. Ne the next biggest vendor is parse float. I tried the same approach of converting uh, the bytes directly to the float. Big Endian. Ooh, we got the nice Big Endian babies. Ooh, the Big Endians. Uh, attempt one, attempt two. I don't see how these things are going to work because you're still using parse float. You don't need parse float. The attempt was using the binary built-in package, but its performance was a lot worse. The second attempt was using the bytes, uh, the bytes convert from uh, the perf package. Uh, let's see, as you can see here, but the results was equivalent. So I considered parsing the individual bytes, but I, let's see, but I couldn't thought in any real improvement to the function. But I couldn't thought... However, at this point, I already had consulted uh, some of the Java solutions, and one of the best approaches uh, they used is converting the temperature to an int instead of floats, which proved to be a lot more efficient. He's lost, uh, he lost his mind while optimizing. Yeah, some of the English is a little hard in this one. Some of the English is a little hard. Uh, I told you, goddamn it, integer is a gift from God. It, well, yes, it's, that's because the, uh, the float specification is crazy, and you already know that it's up to two digits, a period, and one digit. So it's kind of like... You really don't even need to parse int. You need to just simply, you know, you could have the simplest number function that's just like 0 through 9, 0 through 9, period, skip it, 0 through 9. That's it. Right? Like, I, I don't know. It feels like you, you don't even need to do a parse int at all. Already uh, showed some improvement, but notice that if we just convert, because you don't even have to check, like, you check for a negative sign once. You know, uh, uh, but notice that if we convert the data uh, to int from string, we'll lose the decimal point. Thus, I wrote a custom int conversion that will keep the decimal point and generate an int equivalent in float temperature this, this, this. Uh, we can just have the final result by dividing the mean, min, max by 10. Let's go. That'd be good. That's all you need to do. I think... Bytes to int. Is it negative? Yes, it is negative. Result. There you go. I like it. I like it. I like it. This is good. Okay. This is exactly what you want. This is fantastic. This is fantastic. Negative, do this, this. I don't think you really need to do this. I guess you do need to do that. You do have to multiply by 10. Yeah, what am I saying? You have to do that. Anyways, uh, again, uh, well, maybe. I, I'm sure there's probably another way you could make this better. But, uh, again, another large improvement. 3.3 uh, 3 seconds. Nice. Nice. Let's go. We're getting so far down. Oh, uh, we've seen a lot. We've seen a lot of main time thing. We got to stack these bad boys. Uh, custom scan. Uh, the custom scan function is very straightforward. We just needed to read the bytes until we find the slash end. Yep. So there must be. Yeah, there you go. Scanner. So they're going to try to take out this chunk right here. Because if you take out this chunk, you're going to see a huge, you're going to see a huge W right here. Yeah, you have to do the 10x to, yeah. Uh, this, let's see, the custom scan function is very straightforward. We just read the bytes until we find the slash end. Yep, all right. That shouldn't be too hard. Read all these things, blah, 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 blah. I think we all know what's going on here. 
by the way, multiple return items are just fantastic. Okay. I love implied tuples. Can we all just take a moment and say that if you can't return multiple values from a function, your language is weak. Okay. Weak. No, no, that's not returning multiple. You're returning a single one. You're destructuring on both sides. That does not count. This does not count. There's a whole set of problems that go along with that. When you return an object, again, you have to like type that object. You have to build it up. There's like all sorts of things you have to do when you have to do that. Okay. It does. It in fact does not count. This does not count. This in fact does not count. This is coping. This is called cope. You, you TypeScript bros have just, you've, you guys have lost it. You guys have genuinely lost it. You, you know what you should do? You should just take the L, okay, and say, yeah, it's true. We don't got multiple return parameters, but we can. We can at least create an object, wrap the object, return the object, and destructure said object, okay? That's not the same. We are not the same. You got to remember, when you return an array or an object, you're also getting all the other things that an object does. Must be talking about JS. We are tech-savvy, Travi. People are trying to say that this, like JavaScript can do this too. You just wrap a little array around it or just do, or just put a little object right there. Easy, not hard. And it's just like, well, it's not the same. There's still, like JavaScript constructs a lot of things when it comes to an object. Right? It does put something in the nursery GC. You must remember that. There's a nursery GC. It gets added to the nursery GC. There's like things that happen, okay? It's not for freezy. It's not, it's not zero. It's not zero cost. All right, so as usual, look at this. This is our flame graph. Okay, so it looks like we got, we got to do some sort of, we got to do some stacking here, okay? We got to stack these sons of bitches. Custom hash. I began considering a custom uh, computation for the map hash after noticing an increased uh, relevance of function sum right. At this point, I had the, done some analysis and could extract some insights about the data in the measurements file. One interesting finding was determining the number of bytes required uh, to represent a station name without colliding with other stations. In my database, I found that I needed nine bytes with values ranging from 65 to 190. Using this information, I had the idea of concatenating every number into a single large UN64 while ensuring that the value does not surpass the upper limit of this. I think that's fine. But you're still having to, like, do a bunch of math to get stuff out. I'm not sure if I buy this as, like, a win. I'm not sure if I buy this. Before implementing the, uh, my solution, I benched it against my uh, fun half running those functions, this one. Okay. Yeah, well, I guess this wins. There you go. I guess you're doing a special case hash, but how often are you colliding? Like the real question is, is that are you actually slowing down all the map side of things? That's where the danger comes. Whenever you write your own hash function, your hash function, your hash function may be faster, but it may collide more. And you may, you may get yourself some oopsie daisies on the other side. You get, a, you, get a, you get a real problem potentially. So, you know, I'm not saying this is a great idea. It's worth noting that this hash is very situation and may fail, uh, fall, let's see, fail in uh, different data sets. A problem for later. Nonetheless, uh, in this particular case, the result was 2.7 seconds. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Okay. I still think, I still think we got some things left here. Okay. Uh, inline functions. The consumer, let's see, consumer is a hot, let's see, is the hot path. Thus, any function call outside of it can uh, potentially generate unnecessary overhead. However, inlining all the functions didn't show any improvement, but made me lose the profiling information. Edit. I just learned that go inline functions automatic, automatically whenever possible. You don't need yeah. There you go. Fantastic. Uh, Workers reading the file. While drafting this article, I realized that I was super close to reaching the max, uh, the minimum threshold I had set with the main thread configuration. Upon analyzing, most of the time in the main thread was related to Go routine communication, with 0.98 seconds to reading the file and 0.13 seconds to communicating the data to coroutines. It struck me that I could just move the file reference to a consumer and completely eliminate the communication overhead, including replacing the communication buffer for a fixed buffer, reducing the memory allocation overhead. Yeah, but you're locking. Are you really? I mean, I guess if you're saying that your your reading is is better, it's not cheating. It's just that you're assuming that you're. I mean, it could be right because you're not actually doing any sort of. I mean, to be completely fair, you're not copying buffers anymore, and you're able to. Uh, if if there's already a mutex in the channel then why not just try your own? Because then there's no, because you're not actually doing, there's no buffering. There's no extra anything going on. You're just literally doing that. This is actually pretty interesting. Okay. By delegating the reading task to the consumers, the Go routine can locally, the only hard part is when you read, how do you not accidentally read so far as to hit 
hit a new line. That's where my question is, is that you have to read to a new line. And then you have to like not read. A mutex is a spin lock underneath the hood. I think you're right. I think it might be a spin lock underneath the hood. By delegating the reading tasks uh, to the consumer, the GOAT routine can locally read from the file using a mutex to avoid any concurrency issues. For testing purposes, I'll, let's see, only I will discard the first and last line of the buffer to avoid complex distribution leftover logic for now. The results uh, were reduced further to 2.1 seconds. Yeah, see, I'm, consider- see, I'm curious about the distribution of little end line things, right? How do you do the end lines? I don't know how they did that. Trash bin. In order to recover the first and last line of each chunk, I created a trash bin go routine uh, that receives the discarded paths from other go routines and tried to merge the individual parts to complete the line. That sounds crazy. How this can't be right. Notice that the first line uh, of the go routine is always complete, uh, complete uh, valid line. The last line of the go routine is always empty. The file ends with slash n. All parts of the line between the match, let's see, matched by their ID. Each read from uh, f- each read from file increases the ID. The first line is kept as the previous ID, and the last line assumes the next ID. This process is controlled by the same mutex used in reading the file, guaranteeing the consi- uh, concurrency consistency. I don't know how this works. I don't understand how things are reading file like this. I don't know how you're even guaranteeing this order. Question. Couldn't you just have a global byte that's like, say, I don't know, 500 bytes or something like that, just some small amount of bytes, that the last one that you're reading while you have the lock mutex is that you read back, take that trash amount, and put it into this little global buffer, and then when you unlock, you're actually locking two things at once instead of one. Wouldn't you just have that? You, you Like, I, I don't see why you'd want to use, like, a channel or something like that, a Go routine that receives. Like, th- that's the confusing part is this Go routine receiving business that I don't really quite understand. Name and temp buffer. I finally realized that I don't need a name and temp buffer. Yeah, I know. Uh, I Let's see. If I just use the subslice of the read buffer, I don't need to copy the name and temperature buffer over and over again. With this change, I further reduced it to two seconds, pretty much. 2.07 seconds. Okay. We're getting we're getting a Swiss, a Swiss map. I think we missed it. We missed some statement with the Swiss map. All right. All right. We're getting smaller. We're getting smaller. Finishing up uh, with grid test. I had to finish uh, up in style. I wanted to perform a new grid test. However, I needed more samples for a setting in order to address the time variation, which is too, uh, which is much too close uh, to each other now. Since I removed the channel buffer, I only have two parameters. Read the buffer size, read buff size, and the number of workers. After 15 runs for each configuration, as you can see, let's see. All right. Could be achieved in less than two seconds in some runs. Now... Using the winner configuration for the final test, I increased the number of runs to 55 and closed everything in the computer but the terminal. The results are the following. Pretty good job. Pretty dang good job. I feel like this would be a fun challenge to do just because I've never used any of the GoProf tools, uh, the PProf tools. I've never... I haven't used them in the Go land. I just love the fact that they exist here. It just seems so beautiful. It'd be fun to do. Link. Well, I've already linked it once, people. Come on. Get, get your shit in the game, people. The P-Prof. The P-P-Prof. That, uh, that uh, P-Prof gun? Thank you. Uh, still mind-blowing that Java managed to get it to 1.5 seconds. There must be something that they're doing. You know, There's probably something that is done wrong here. Because it, you know, someone was saying they got it in like milliseconds, but there has to be something wrong with that, right? And what I mean by, let's say, I'm, go, I'm going to have to do this, aren't I? I know, Travi. That's how I already feel. I already feel like I'm going to have to do this. I already feel like I do. Whipped mango. Thank you very much. Um, final thoughts. Okay. Moreover, for me, uh, the results are more incredible because I, I didn't bother too much about manipulating the bytes individually, uh, like the Java best, like the best Java solution. Okay. There we go. Fantastic. All right. This was a great article. This is a great card. See, do, do you see why we like to do this? Does everyone see why you like to do this? This is actually kind of fantastic. This is great. Apps absolutely love it. Uh, this one's a lot better than the Java one. You think so? Compile Linux from scratch and let's get those numbers down. Absolutely. That's the easiest way to do it. The name is, is someone saying it's less than one second? No, guys, guys, look, it says right here, 
Okay, dog, what are you talking about? It's right here. Hey, the name, the name. It's the primogen. You know what I mean? That's the name. 